From Microbe TV, this is Immune, Episode 1, recorded on October 23rd, 2017. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Rack in Yellow, and you're listening to the podcast about the body's defenders against disease. Joining me today for this first episode from Ithaca, New York, Cynthia Leifer. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. It's a bit cloudy here in Ithaca and about 55 degrees, 13 Celsius. So it's actually quite a beautiful week this week. My daughter just went back to Ithaca yesterday. Yeah, the leaves are changing. It's just gorgeous here. Yeah. Also joining us from Worcester, Ohio, Stephanie Langle. Hey now, Dr. (laughs) R and Dr. L. It's great to be here. Very excited to start this podcast. And those are, that's the team, the immune team for for this, at least for now. Right. The trifecta. The (laughs) the immune (laughs) trifecta. That's very good. Immune factor. And um, we're going to tell you a little bit about ourselves and what we hope to do with this podcast, which has been in the making for quite a while. I had to find the right team. It has. Right? And uh, we'll tell you all about that. Um, let's start with uh, Cindy. Can I call you Cindy? I can, right? Absolutely. Please do. Yes. And you're at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. And I met you there earlier this year, right? That's correct, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> as part of my visit, I was meeting with faculty. I met with Cindy, and it was clear. And I, I actually asked you at that time, I said, when are you going to do a podcast on immunology? <laughs> ah, I'd forgotten that, right. Yeah, you said, funny, you should ask. I said, do you want to do it? And initially you said, no, I'm too busy. <laughs> but at, at some point, I don't remember when, you said, let me think about it, right? Yes, I did. <laughs> and you decided to do it, which is great. Yeah, uh, I think I think communicating science uh, in a broader audience is just so critically important. So I'm thrilled to be involved in this. Tell us your history. Where are you from originally? I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. Wow. And I, yeah, and I grew up there uh, and I went to college, University of Maryland, College Park. Mm-hmm. Go Terps. Terps, and then, the turbans. Oh, listen, the ASV is going to be in College Park oh, next yeah. summer. Uh, cool. It has changed so much since I was there. So yeah. there's so many new buildings and um, lots of new exciting science going on there. But that's when I had an opportunity to work in a research lab, and that that was that was all she wrote. <laughs> well, did you I, go there as a, as a, a bio major or a science major? Right I the- did. I did. I thought that I was going to go to medical school. I think this mm-hmm. is a common thing that a lot of people say. Um, but I wasn't so thrilled about the constant memorization and regurgitation when I started to think about why things happened and how things interact. When I got in the lab and realized that, hey, that's how you can answer that. I said, that's what I want to do. Mm-hmm. And so from there, I went to graduate school um, at Weill Cornell Medical College um, in New York City. And um, I was there for a number of years. And it's funny because I never visited Ithaca while I was there. I was <laughs> die, die hard New York City. Um, and then from there, uh, when I finished up my PhD, which I did with Carl Nathan, um, who is known for macrophages and tuberculosis and nitric oxide and some interesting things like that, I went down to um, the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, to their intramural research program, where I followed my passion of looking at innate immunity, which we'll talk about. There's lots of um, parts of our immune system that are pre-wired and ready to go. And so I was interested in looking at receptors that were really important for recognizing infectious diseases. And so I did that work down at the NIH and was there for about five years. Uh, There's an amazing immunology community down there, and I was so glad to have been involved with all of that. And then I started interviewing for faculty positions, and I I came to Ithaca, and I really liked it. I really liked the department, and I've been there since, since 2005. I I just saw something the other day. You know, um, Cornell is building something on Roosevelt Island, I think. Is that right? Yes, they are. Yeah, we have a tech college there. Mm -hmm. I saw a, a release about 
some uh, some initiative to try and improve communication between New York Ith- New York Cornell and Ithaca Cornell. <laughs> and I'm not sure how that's going to work cuz distance really is an impediment. <laughs> it it well, it's not it, it's not that far. So it's four and a half hours, which seems like a really long way if you're in New York City and things are so close together. Um but we 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 have a bus and we love our bus and it goes back and forth two times a day and it has Wi-Fi so everybody works on there. And so there's lots of mm. ways to try and foster the interactions between the the multiple campuses. So now we have the Wild Cornell campus campus, as well as the tech campus, campus here. And actually, there are satellite campuses around the world as well. Mm. And there's a big initiative with some money behind it, which is good to try and get collaborations going. We're currently writing a proposal to have a joint retreat with the immunologists down at Weill and see if we can foster some more interaction. Mm. So it should be fun. When I was arranging my uh, seminar trip. The, the the assistant said, "We do have a bus you can take." I said, "Nope." I took that bus so many times as a college student. I, You're I done. Learned, uh, no more. Sorry. Oh, but it's a different bus. So we have a specific Cornell bus. It's called the Cornell Campus to Campus bus. Yeah, I'm sure it's, it's great. Super yeah. fancy. <laughs> and sure it has drinks and snacks. That's sarcasm in his voice. I I think I'm sure it's great. But yeah, I took a public bus and it was horrible. But I I had booked a flight and that. I got to the airport and the flight was canceled. So I got back in my car and I drove. <laughs> Sometimes it's it's even better to drive. You know, we do uh, when I travel internationally, I actually drive down to New York City and take a, a plane out of there because yeah. uh, we have a great close airport 10 minutes away. But um, it the you have to travel to yeah. uh, a, a in between airport to get anywhere you're going. So Steph, what were you going to say? I inter- I inter- oh, no, you're fine. So, Dr. L, you're at the College of Veterinary Medicine. Is that correct? I am, yes. Yes, yes. And so within that college, what is the department that you hail from? So I am in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology. Well, somebody was commenting, uh, looking at my background and your background, and we have a very strong vet med presence on this podcast. Our vet med game is strong, Good, as they say. Yeah, it's awesome. I, I awesome. think one of, one of the um, things that really drew me here was the opportunity to look at comparative immunology across animals. And I haven't done as much as the, of that as I as I could, but I'm getting into that. We're doing some canine research and dabbling in some other things. We've done some bovine research in the past. So, so we try to, to broaden out from our human centric immune uh, <laughs> research. So uh, could you summarize, you know, briefly your, your research interests now in your lab? Yeah. So overall, I'm really interested how our body recognizes um, infections and induces inflammatory responses and how sometimes those responses go wrong. So we're really interested in a particular type of cell called a macrophage, which we'll talk about. Um, And these cells are all over the body and they're really the first responders. They recognize microbial infection and initiate the immune responses. And they do this by using a particular class of receptors called toll-like receptors, which are very interesting in and of themselves because uh, toll came from uh, Christine Nusslein Volhard, who won the Nobel Prize for describing the role of toll in Drosophila. And the story goes that she was uh, making mutants of Drosophila and looked through the microscope and went toll, which is apparently some sort of um, uh, exclamation. Uh, so that that's how she originally named the gene in Drosophila. And in humans and other animals, we have toll-like receptors that are important in initiating inflammatory responses. And so we've looked at a long time at how these receptors are regulated. And we're particularly interested in some of these recognized nucleic acids, and you might know that as DNA and RNA. And uh, these receptors recognize DNA and RNA, but that's highly conserved in both in viruses, bacteria, humans. Um, and we want to know why and how we can regulate recognition of DNA and RNA through these receptors. Why don't we all have autoimmune disease, because if you trigger these receptors inappropriately, we end up with autoimmunity. And so we try to understand how these receptors are regulated at the molecular level and at the cellular level. Great. This is all great for our podcast. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Steph, where are you from? Yes. um, I'm originally from North Canton, Ohio, not too far from where I'm at now. Um, I went to, I did my undergrad 
at Ohio State. I was in animal the animal sciences department. It's a part of the agricultural and life sciences side of campus at Ohio State, but I also did a minor in biology. So really throughout undergrad, I thought that I wanted to go to veterinary school. I very much identified with becoming a veterinarian. That was something pretty consistent until I did a um, summer rotating in a ruminant nutrition lab. And um, for some of those who might not know, a ruminant actually has four stomachs. They have a huge capacity of microbes, protozoa, fungi, bacteria, phages, which aren't talked about as much, but this just cacophony of different types of microorganisms. And it really was from that rotation and then continuing in, in his lab that I just became hooked. And I became quite conflicted because I don't know if y'all have experienced this when you really identify with doing something for so long and then it changes and you really have to kind of take a, a breath and be like, okay, I, I need to explore this further. So instead of going off to veterinary school, I decided to get a master's. For me, that was a, a good way to bridge between figuring out if graduate school was something I really wanted. I know a lot of people don't do master's in between um, the undergrad and PhD, but I, I felt it, it was really uh, good for me. I went to Virginia Tech and I worked in immunology, uh, but specifically worked with colostrum. So Colostrum is the first milk that any animal mammal gives for their young. And the purpose of that is nutritional, obviously fats and um, carbohydrates to sustain life. But really interestingly, I think it's getting a lot more attention are the cells and antibodies and a whole host of other immune components in that colostrum. So what we did was we took the colostrum, we fed it to calves with or without white blood cells. I should back up when I say calves, I do mean bovine babies. So this would be little baby calves that were birthed from their mothers to really see in a large animal model how these leukocytes of colostrum, how they interact in the in the body and we take them out in vitro, we look at them in, in plates and, and we try to determine what their functions are and how they act. Um, and and so from there, I, I just knew that graduate school was it. PhD was what I wanted and I had this very heavy background in, in large animal um, livestock. I had worked on a dairy farm for years up until going to college. So I wanted to really get into the mechanisms of immunology, but I love the idea of using a large animal model instead of a mouse to learn how the immune system reacts with pathogens. Um, so from there, from Virginia Tech, I actually did come back to Ohio State and, and not just because, you know, it's my home state, but also my advisor, Dr. Linda Safe, she is really known for using pigs and um, cattle, uh, piglets and calves as models for viruses, for human diseases. And we do that using what we kind of term bubble pigs and bubble calves, but essentially it's germ-free large animal models. And, and mice have this as well, um, kind of these germ-free conditions where you can introduce a virus and then um, see how that animal responds. So that's what brought me here. What really made me fascinated and just very happy to be here with this program, my project, um, my current research is focusing on what we term the gut mammary secretory IgA axis. And that's kind of a mouthful, but the parts of that um, kind of explain what it is. So what I study is a porcine coronavirus that infects a pregnant mother. Then it infects through the gut. So it is an enteric virus. In the gut, there are tons of lymph nodes and immune sites that have the capacity to generate B um, memory cells and plasma cells that secrete antibodies. And so those antibodies, those plasma cells are actually going to come out of the gut, go into blood and then circulate through blood. And we see starting really in the third trimester in pigs and humans as well in mice, um, these cells start to be retained by the mammary gland. And they're doing that because eventually they have to be secreted into milk to give to the baby. So there's this translational imprinting that's happening from what the mother is infected with or vaccinated with, the memory cells trans um, communicated to the baby through the milk. That process is what I'm studying and it's really, um, I'm enjoying it a lot. Of course, I have to work with very large pregnant pigs who do not like that I am manipulating their mammary glands, as you could imagine. That's, you know, wouldn't be 
a fun time for anyone. So yeah, pigs are a bit yeah. temperamental. <laughs> oh, they are. I've I worked I've worked with a lot of large animals, and I. I have to say, if I'm to do a postdoc in mouse models, which I hope to, I won't miss milking 500-pound animals at 3 (laughs) a.m. That's for sure. (laughs) Wow, that's quite an experience. Yeah, it is. It's it's great. It's definitely this program has lended me to get the some mechanistic type of of research, but also working, you know, in an applicable sense because this is relevant to farmers who do use pigs, and this virus is highly economically um, important. So. I really hope to bridge this research, though. We don't know a lot about pregnant women immunology. We really have very limited vaccines for pregnant women. There's only two that are FDA approved. There's really only four that people, um, that groups are have kind of are working on. So I would love to really use this experience to find ways to develop vaccines for pregnant women that, you know, enhance the life of them and, and their babies as well. So do you, uh, you're a PhD student, do you know when you're finishing? I am. Sometime next year, that's always the <laughs> the question that I think I have heard from every family member and colleague who's not in graduate school. I don't know if you all experience that. So Absolutely. that question makes me sweat. I just start like so wet. <laughs> I always said, I'm done when I'm done. You'll know when I tell you. <laughs> oh, that is the perfect response. I think for this year, I'm going to post like a status to family and don't ask me at Christmas. No, it's um, I sometime next year. I have a committee meeting coming up in January and we'll review. I've done a lot of uh, pigs, a lot of experiments. So I'm hoping sometime next year, just not not quite sure when. We'll see how I have pigs right now. So they better behave themselves. That's all. That's will will help determine when that date is. So you said you're going to do a postdoc, and then what's your ultimate trajectory? What do you want to do with your career? Yes, yes. Well, I'd love to do a postdoc. I, I really like to do one kind of culminating my experiences and do it in a lab that looks at mouse models and, and thinking about human disease. And I would love to really end up doing what you both do, oh, having a lab focusing on immunology during pregnancy and the neonatal period and trying to develop vaccines that that take advantage of the very special nature of a pregnant immune system. Well, uh, we, we'll we be interested to follow your career here on Immune. I know. Mm-hmm. I know. I was thinking about that. It is, it may, it, uh, it's a good thing, but also can be a bit, you know, my, I feel my cortisol raising, you know, as I think about people yeah. who will listen. Well, you're making, <laughs> yeah, you're making your career very, very public. That's true. Um, and, you know, if you'd rather not talk about it, that's fine. We had, when I started Twevo yeah. this week in Evolution with Nels Eldy, he had he had been at his assistant professor position for a few years. And I said, let's talk about the progress to tenure. And so periodically he would give us updates. And then at one point he was up for tenure and waiting. And then he got tenure, you know, just a few months ago. So oh, it was really fabulous. cool. And the, the cool thing was he was... He was looking at other jobs in the meantime, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just in case. And he was traveling all over and so forth. So I think that's cool because it illustrates some of the things we have to do in this field, right? And people typically don't know. So right. uh, I think this podcast will be long live. And uh, I hope that uh, we can learn about what's happening with uh, with your very young career. And by the way, Steph, you should, yes. you've always called me Dr. R., <laughs> right, and I, I think you should call me Vincent. Me that. too. Call me Cindy. Okay. Okay, that's and fine. He, here's a reason I've been reading a book by John Udell called Truth Wins, which is a free download. We'll put a link for that in the show notes. This everything about immune will be at microbe.tv slash immune, and I'm already in- encouraging you to send in your emails immune at microbe.tv. Uh, Truth Wins is a book that John Udell who both of you will agree is an immunologist, right? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. He's written a book sort of based on his career. He gives a little summary of what he did and how to be a biomedical scientist. It is just great because for me, where my career is in its twilight, I love it because I'm reading it and going, oh yeah, that's why I did that. <laughs> <laughs> and for someone new, Steph, you should read this for sure. I know you're really busy, but it goes quick. It's on my list. And- uh, here's a quote that's relevant to this first name. He's talking about his experience. He, he went to Princeton and he worked in Arnie Levine's lab. And he writes, first, he made me call him Arnie. 
not Dr. or Professor Levine. This was actually quite difficult at first. Not until decades later did I really understand why this is so important. If the PI is Dr. So-and-so and everyone else is Pam or Jim, this creates a barrier for intellectual discourse. In a good laboratory, the work has to be based simply on the best ideas, not the source of the ideas. It's perfect. It's absolutely perfect. You, you I level, totally agree. Level the playing field, right? So I had my first technician. She would call me Dr. R, Dr. R. And I said, no, you, you can't do that. I want you to call me. And it was hard because it's hard, you know, but eventually. And if you forget, Steph, we'll correct you. I might slip, but you can correct me. But I bet you call your PI uh, Dr. Safe, right? <laughs> Yes, yes. I think <laughs> I probably I'll feel most comfortable going first name once I think once the program once you get done and you can look back as more of a colleague. But right now, I, you know, I kind of feel comfortable with the whole hierarchy of, um, you know, trainee and trainer. Okay. So that's fine. <laughs> but All right. here is great. I'll, I'll do that. Um, so what we're doing here, we're, we started this podcast, we think we one is needed in the field of immunology. <clears throat> and of course, I've I've got a lot of podcasts under my belt. I've been doing it for nine years, and we have all of them at microbe.tv. We have a virology one, microbiology, parasitism, uh, evolution, and a few others. I've always wanted to start an immunology one, but I had to find the right people. And Steph uh, appeared on TWIV 356, and I've gotten to know her over the years on Twitter and so forth. You actually had a podcast for a while with a dairy farmer, right? I did. I did. Yes. And, yeah. What did you talk about? <laughs> well, what we did, it, he's a really, um, well, he's very thoughtful. He's a well-educated guy and he's very interested in the science of farming because there actually is quite a bit of science in agriculture. I mean, agricultural science is um, big and big business too. So he, he, we hooked up and we just talked about a lot of the different things, soil biology. We talked about infectious diseases in animals. So we really loved it, but it got too busy, I think with his schedule in mind to make it work. And I was searching to do something. I'm, um, more podcast like, so this, this came about. He used to write into TWIV because he was very interested in viruses and microbiology. I got to know him as well. Yeah. And they sort of based, you based your podcast on, on the TWIV model. You would do a paper, right? And yep. I, I thought it was very good. And then, then it stopped. And I said, Steph, you want to do a, <laughs> a, an immunology podcast? And that's how yeah. you got involved in this. So, I mean, the, the exact format we're still not sure of. We're going to do papers, of course, but we'd also like to mix it up a bit and maybe sometime not do a paper or do things that are in the news that you might like to hear about. Uh, today we'll Absolutely. do a, today we'll do a paper for you, but send us your ideas. You know, if you have things we'd like to talk about, we'd love to hear it. All right. And I'd like to hear if there's specific things like immunology terms or mechanisms or interactions that you want to hear about as well, because immunology is really its own language mm -hmm. and it's so different from everything else we study with the web of interacting cells. It, it can be daunting to people to start to try and understand and unpack what goes on in an immune response. Cindy, do you teach an immunology course? I do. I teach a lot. I teach our basic immunology course, and that's mostly undergraduates. Um, it's a 400-level course, so they take it in usually their senior year. All There's a couple ambitious juniors and an occasional sophomore who take it. I also teach um, our advanced immunology class, and that's directed at graduate students and primarily our immunology graduate students or graduate students in other fields that have projects that use immunology really heavily and want to understand it. We'll take that course, and occasionally we'll have a very ambitious undergraduate take that one. And then I also teach veterinary students. Students. So in veterinary school, they have to learn immunology, and we have a really intensive course where they actually learn all of the ologies, virology, parasitology, microbiology, epidemiology, and immunology, all in the same course. But what that's oh really gosh. cool about, but it's, what, it's really cool because they get to put it all together, you know? They have these tutor sessions where they discuss cases of, you know, an animal comes in with XYZ disease, and they have to unpack that, and they cross all those disciplines and use all of that information to synthesize it together to really um, to really learn in a deep way. And so that's that's fun to see. It's really interesting to teach at all these different levels and everyone has a different thing that they that they want to get out of what they're learning about immunology. So it's fun. When uh, over on TWIV, what we did in the very beginning, we would do a series called Virology 101. 
And yes. every few months we would just take an episode and do a basically, you know, an introductory part. Um, we would all talk. It was very different from a traditional lecture, but we would have slides and we would post oh. those. We might think about doing that for that would be Immunology neat. 101. You know, it's, you go through the various concepts and so forth. Just dedicate an episode to it. We could ask you questions and so forth. Might be fun. I think it's a great idea because I watched those Virology 101s when I had to tutor the veterinary students. And I said, I don't really know the virology at all. And so I went and, and watched those and I encouraged my students to watch them as well. All right. And there was a couple of sentiment, sentiments on Twitter. Uh, kind of, I had asked, what do people want? And they mm. said that. They said, we'd love an immune 101 just to help out with the great. terminology. All right. So Well, we've we've picked some interesting paper to talk about today and maybe you guys will interrupt and ask Ella some more basic stuff so we can get some of that 101 right. across. Sure. Hey, one thing we're trying to do here is limit this podcast to an hour. Yes. And so now, um, Cindy, we have about 20 minutes. We have a challenge. <laughs> so you Tell us <laughs> about the paper you've picked. So I picked a paper that is a mouthful, especially if you're not that familiar with immunology, but it's called thermoneutrality, but not UCP1 deficiency, suppresses monocyte mobilization into blood. And the senior author on this is Gwen Randolph, um, and she is at WashU St. Louis. And interestingly, she was a postdoc when I was a graduate student, so I knew her. Oh. And uh, so I followed her career, and she's really interested in these monocytes. So these monocytes are these blood um, innate immune cells that play a variety of different roles in many, many different diseases. But one of the things they do is they go out into tissues and they differentiate. So they become a slightly different kind of cell called a macrophage. And those are the cells I mentioned when I was talking about my own work. And so we're interested in those macrophages. Macrophages. And this caught my eye because she presented this work at a recent um, conference, the Society for Leukocyte Biology Conference. And I was fascinated by this because they basically put mice at 4 degrees Celsius, at 22 degrees Celsius, and at 30 degrees Celsius. And we don't often think about that because our, our mouse facilities where we house our mice are at 22 degrees. And it turns out they're at 22 degrees because that's a comfortable temperature for a human. Right. And it's and it's not it's not the most pleasant, comfortable temperature for a mouse. A mouse actually prefers thirty degrees, and so putting it that four degrees is like us going into Antarctica or something. And so she was really interested in what that does to trafficking of these monocytes because she's interested in lymphocyte trafficking and monocyte trafficking in the lymph which is the equivalent of blood, but it carries all of the immune cells around the body. And um, her postdoc was setting up some experiments and housing these mice at different temperatures and says, why don't we do this cool experiment? Let's see if they get atherosclerosis. Because there's this idea that there's a... Uh, protective effect of being at warmer temperatures. So they say the people near the equator have a lower um, le incidence of atherosclerosis and heart disease. So does this have anything to do with this? And so they put these mice at different temperatures and they have to use a special kind of mouse because mice don't get atherosclerosis. Mm -hmm. so, they use, so they use mice that are deficient in a protein called LDL, which is um, uh, low density lipoproteins and they carry fats around in the blood and if you have too much fat in the blood, these bind up all the fats and they, um, the macrophages that are in your blood vessels take them up and they eat them and they get filled up with this fat and cholesterol and they become really inflammatory and they damage the blood vessel. And it turns out that heart disease is a really big problem. You might know it's, a, it's the number one cause of death in the U.S. And it's estimated at $316 billion a year in healthcare costs go to treating heart disease. So understanding exactly how all of this is happening is important. And so they're also interested in um, the idea that fat is not fat. It's not all the same. We have what's called brown fat and white fat. And our white fat is the jiggly stuff that we think about when we think about, you know, having the extra weight on our bodies. But brown fat is completely different. So brown fat has a whole lot of energy producing mitochondria in each cell. But they also express a lot of this protein that's in this title, this UCP1. And what that does is that short circuits the production of ATP. And instead of making energy, it makes heat. And so this is the heat producing part of the body. So if you have more brown fat, you produce more heat. 
and you have um, less body fat. And so they're looking at all these different connections between this idea that the mice shouldn't be at 22, they should be at 30. You have this brown fat versus white fat and this UCP1. And so all of these things are floating around in their head. And they say, well, let's just do some easy thing. Let's take these LDL receptor deficient mice that get atherosclerosis if you feed them the McDonald's diet and see what happens. And when they did this, it was amazing because the mice at 30 degrees got much less atherosclerosis. Than, and than the lower temperature. Than the lower temperature mice at, at uh, 22 degrees. And the there was also some really interesting things in their first figure is that the mice at four degrees ate twice as much as the mice at the other temperatures. So they ate a lot more, but they didn't gain weight. Mm-hmm. And they had all of this brown fat, and this brown fat just made lots of heat. And in fact, if you took mm-hmm. the temperature of these mice, the mice at four degrees had the highest body temperature. Mm. And the mice at 30 degrees had the lowest body temperature. So they're eating to regulate their temperature at the low environmental they're, temperature, right? That's right. They're eating a lot more to just to regulate their body temperature because they're not producing as much energy, which in is the, interesting. In, in the wild, mice certainly live at very low temperatures, right? Especially in they the can. winter and so forth. Yeah, yeah, they can. Yeah, mm. exactly. And so they have this ability to to short circuit and make body heat when they're cold. So, so. this UCP1... Is, in, is that important for coupling diet and, and thermoregulation? It is. So um, when, when, there, when, the, when you don't need the extra heat, you downregulate expression of this protein. Mm-hmm. So in fact, the mice at 30 degrees have basically no detectable UCP1. And the mice at 4 degrees have very high levels of this. Um, so they make this brown fat and they, they create all of this heat. And so they're asking, is there this connection between the expression of this protein and the development of atherosclerosis? And so the, the bottom line is that it's, it's really complex because they found different um, reasons for why a mouse at four degrees or 30 degrees does or doesn't have atherosclerosis. But basically after the first few experiments at four degrees, they decided that those mice are very, very different. They have high cortisol levels, short lifespans, and they're, they're just very different from the other two at 22 and 30. So they focused the majority of their studies on comparing mice at our normal facility temperature of 22 and the, uh, the high temperature, higher temperature um, thermo neutrality at 30. Yeah, I did have that question about um, the four degrees temperature settings. So they discontinued that basically because of what you said. There was an inability for them to kind of extrapolate and they couldn't remove the complexity of they were stressed, you know, they they died sooner. So is that why they discontinued? They did, yeah. And okay. I, I think because it probably, seems interesting to keep the four degrees treatment group. I mean, there definitely was huge differences, but but that does make sense if they didn't, if it was too complex. Yeah, it it really added um, a whole nother layer of looking at how the stress hormones are affecting immune cells and things like that. So so they really focused their studies on 22 versus 30. So the title says thermal neutrality, but not UCP1 deficiency suppresses mobilization of monocytes, right? Right. So right. can you explain that conclusion? Right. Yeah. So, so what they were trying to do is... Uh, the monocytes are in the blood and they come out into the tissues, like I mentioned, mm-hmm. and they will go into the vet blood vessels and then they eat up the, um, the lipid, the excess lipids. And so one of the things they found um, was that when they, when they had these mice at 30 degrees and they were protected, they actually didn't have significantly higher cholesterol or anything. So they were wondering, well, then how, how are they protected from disease? You know, did, did they, was it actually what I should say is they had higher levels of triglycerides, but no difference in cholesterol. Mm -hmm. Um, But so one would think though, if you've got high triglycerides, which is the fats in your blood that you would have a more higher propensity for atherosclerosis, but they were lower. And so they started looking at where monocytes were. And so monocytes uh, come out of the bone marrow and then they circulate around the blood and then they'll go out into the tissue. And they did some really cool experiments and um, including some pet uh, analysis where you label the mice with these tracers and put them into this machine and read it where their cells are, which was really cool. But what they found was that the monocytes stayed in the bone marrow and didn't circulate as efficiently in the blood when the mice were at 30 degrees. 
And so mm-hmm. what that means is if you have fewer precursors surra- and floating around in the blood, there's fewer that get out into the tissue and they show that. So the mice at 30 degrees that are fed the high fat diet just have fewer macrophages in their blood vessels mm. um, when they d- develop atherosclerosis. So they develop less atherosclerosis. Do we, and so this, do, go we, ahead. do we understand why the max don't come out as much in the high temperature? So um, they looked a little bit at expression of different cytokine and chemokine receptors. So chemokines are really important for trafficking immune cells. Mm -hmm. And so there are signals that one set of cells secretes a chemokine and another set of cells expresses a receptor and they'll respond to that and move to where the chemokine is produced. And so there's a little bit difference in the expression of these chemokines that are involved in trafficking cells from the bone marrow into the blood and from the blood into um, the tissues. And so they think that um, that might be part of the reason why those cells are retained in the bone marrow and not and not leaving the bone marrow. Okay. Now, uh, UCP1, do we know what it does? Is it a, a, a regulator of transcription or is, is it something else? No, it's a protein that's expressed in the mitochondria. And what it does is it short circuits the production of ATP. So we have the, the ATP synthase machinery that will take uh, the, the hydrogen um, differential across the membrane mm-hmm. and use that to generate ATP and energy. And what they do is they short circuit that. And so it creates heat instead of energy. I see. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's really interesting. Yeah. So- so they say in the uh, this, they have an interesting part in this paper. They have a box called novelty and significance. Yes. And one of the they have what is known, and one of them is the instance, as you said, of cardiovascular events increases in colder temperatures. That's right. So and may- I live in Ithaca, so I'm, 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 I'm good. Good Your situation subject. here. So the question is: <laughs> Have they done studies where they look at people in warm versus cold temperature? I guess that would be temperate versus tropical climates and and seeing a difference in cardiovascular events so so um people people have done epidemiologic studies and they suggest yes that there is a higher incidence um at colder temperatures Hmm. um but but we know there's a lot of factors that contribute to that right depending on where you live in the world you have a different diet you have different exercise you have different exposure to light there's just a lot of things that are different but there's some epidemiologic connections yeah yeah um, I, I think if you're in the northeast of the U.S., for example, which is cold in the winter, not only is it cold, but it's very stressful, right, <laughs> to live here. You get yeah. stuck in traffic, and that it's hard to separate that as a complicating factor, whereas wherever, whenever I go to a warm temperature place, I relax. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So, yeah, well, the, my, they showed the mice at four degrees were stressed. But, you know, the other thing we have to keep in mind is they, they put these mice at that steady temperature, right? So they're at, kept in a cold room, basically, yeah. at four degrees, or they're kept in the warm room. But we tend to be outside, inside, different temperatures. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Our internal, uh, you know, inside uh, offices and things are maintained at a relatively steady temperature. But we also put on jackets and clothes to maintain our temperature. So it's a little bit different than um, what these mice are experiencing. So that's a, that's a caveat to these studies. It was interesting, though, that in that paper, they did take a look. I think it was... 15, over 15,000 samples of, of people in the St. Louis, Missouri area. They give the coordinates so you can look up probably the weather. And they did show that it, in the cold months that they had the same trend of monocytes um, circulating. And so they would then extrapolate that to maybe that there's the same as being seen in bone marrow. But, you know, I was thinking about Brett Brown and beige fat. And I, I just remember it's been relatively recent that they discovered that in humans. So, how, what that means in a mouse compared to a human and, and how an animal, you know, the mouse is using brown and beige fat differently than a human. I think that translation is going to be important, especially since we're talking not only the movement of an immune cell, but metabolism, glucose use, um, and, and comparing the two different species. It, that's absolutely true. I mean, I think one of the key things here is uh, what Gwen was telling me is they submitted this paper and the, the paper came back and said, well, what about humans? And that's when they went and right. contacted. That's when they, this, oh, okay. 
Yeah, exactly. They contacted this epidemiologist, and I, I thought it was, I was absolutely blown away. Where they collected 1,200 samples per month, yeah, a total of yeah. over fifteen thousand samples, and they just bled the people and measured their monocytes, and they could show a seasonal change. Um, you know, a little bit subtle, but but definitely a trend towards you know warmer months, mm. lesser um, monocytes in the blood, and colder months, more, you know, more monocytes in the blood. So that was really interesting. And your point about um, you know this this brown fat, it it's it's a really attractive target for weight loss because people are thinking if we can trick uh, the um, adipocytes, the fat cells, to be more brown like and uh, make heat instead of energy, we could. Uh, just like the mice, when they have high levels of this going on, they have to eat more to maintain the same body temperature and same energy level. So if we ate the same, theoretically, we should burn more energy and lose weight. And so there, th that's why uh, there's a lot of interest in this UCP1 and this brown fat and regulation of um, glucose metabolism in humans as a potential um, way to target um, obesity. And I was also fascinated by how they talked about, you know, they were showing in previous studies that using cold or some type of cold snap in, with humans would, would promote glucose dispersal. And essentially then, like you said, people might lose weight, but they really challenged that concept of, okay, well, maybe the difference between energy metabolism and this monocyte dynamics are two very different things. And so kind of heating off this idea that people should go into like this extreme cold. I think about, um, there are actually in like spas, you can go into like these cryo, I, I don't know, uh. if these big like refrigerators <laughs> because they're trying, I don't know exactly what they're promoting, but I'm assuming it's somewhere along these lines. They, they, they may be trying to promote you lose weight, but, but this paper is interesting because they're saying, well, hold on. It, it could be actually you're promoting atherosclerosis if they already have high levels of fat and their, um, triglycerides in their blood. It's true because, uh, you know, we, we think about, I, I think about it too, when you're outside in the winter, you burn more calories, right? You just, when you're colder, your body needs to produce more energy to maintain the body temperature. And so, yes, one would think that if you go into one of those ice boxes, which I don't think I'd want to do, that sounds no, very, un no. very unpleasant, Safe. but, you know, theoretically you should burn more fat. But I think a key finding from this paper was that, you know, the, the measuring those cortisol levels. And so cortisol is that stress hormone and those were through the roof. And I think, you know, the benefits that you might get of burning more energy are outweighed by the the stress and the fact that when you have those high cortisol levels and stress, it really does promote this um, higher level of fat in the blood. And I don't, I don't think it's going to be counterproductive. Hmm. So this provides insight into mechanisms, right? That's right. But most people don't have a choice of where they live, right? <laughs> so, you know, if you have to live in a cold weather area, what can you do to reduce uh, cardiac events? You can uh, eat less McDonald's food. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can <laughs> exercise, uh, reduce your stress, don't smoke. I think the American Heart Association has uh, seven recommendations. I don't remember what they mm -hmm. are. It's, di mm -hmm. it's diet, exercise, don't smoke. Um, yeah, and there's a couple of other ones that are really important. And those are going to be the major mechanisms of reducing your risk of heart disease. Right. I think going outside in the cold weather and diving into a snowbank in your underwear is probably not the best way to do it. <laughs> and the opposite would not be true. Well, don't just think you can keep smoking and then move to Florida and you'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's true too. <laughs> well, you know, with, with the increased global temperatures mm -hmm. uh, eventually we'll all be, we'll all be warm yeah. you know who knows um you you said mice don't get atherosclerosis right. so even if you feed them very high fat diets they, they do not develop it not not very much not like a human so in a human by the time you're say a teenager you already have deposits in your blood vessels that's a scary thing and it just gets worse mm -hmm. over time and so the more you can do to try and uh, follow those rules to lower your risk the better mm -hmm. throughout mm -hmm. life um, but yeah so mice they don't they don't get a lot of atherosclerosis unless you mutate the genes that are required for clearing the lipids from the blood. So the LDL mice that mm -hmm. the receptor deficient mice that I mentioned. So LDL receptor is on the the liver cells and that binds to the the low density lipoproteins that are in the blood and clears them. So you might know if you've ever gotten a cholesterol test, they measure um, HDL and LDL. 
Mm-hmm. And the HDL is your good cholesterol and your LDL is your bad cholesterol. So the HDL is really good at clearing the cholesterol out of the body. And the LDL is what binds up in the liver, um, is cleared by this LDL receptor. But if you lack that, then the LDLs build up in the blood vessel and cause atherosclerosis in the mouse. Do we understand why mice uh, don't develop it? That would be good to know, right? I don't. I I don't study atherosclerosis, so yeah. I'm not sure if I fully understand why they don't. Yeah, that, it seems to me that if you could figure out the mechanism, you might get insights into preventing it in people, right? Besides diet yeah. and lifestyle changes, you know. I think there's a lot of people trying to understand that. Yeah. Let me ask you a more basic question. Um, a term used in this paper is monocyte, and you work on macrophages. So yes. w- what's the difference? What are they? So they're a different version of the same cell. So all the cells in, in the immune system derived from a hematopoietic stem cell in the bone marrow, and they go through several rounds of differentiation and um, into different blood cell types. And when this, this particular cell type, the monocyte, leaves the bone marrow, it circulates around in the blood, and then it will exit the blood and enter the tissue and differentiate into a macrophage. Okay. And so it's that tissue macrophage that's, that's doing the business end of what's going on. Um, And in different tissues, in different tissues, they have different names, right? They do. So in the brain, we call them microglial cells. In the liver, we call them Kupfer cells. And they're osteoclasts in the bone. So they're all derived from the same precursor. But there's some really interesting things that have come out in the last few years where tissue macrophages are are actually two different populations. So one comes from these blood monocytes throughout life, but some of them are seeded during um, embryonic development from what's called the yolk sac, which sits in on the liver in the fetus. Mm-hmm. And so they exit at very early during development and seed the tissues. And those are tissue resident macrophages. And they behave a little bit differently, although they can do the same types of things. But throughout life, we're constantly reseeding the tissues with these blood-derived monocytes and that mm-hmm. differentiate into the macrophages. And of course, you you talked about in this paper macrophages taking up lipids, but they do many other things too, right? Oh yeah, they they are phagocytes, so they they eat, and they're macrophages, so they eat big things, and so they'll they'll eat bacteria, they'll eat particles, they'll eat lipids, they basically will eat anything you put in front of them. And they're also a kind of antigen presenting cell, right? Yes, they do. And so antigen presentation is something we haven't talked about, but there's important connection between um, pathogen infection and being able to produce antibodies that um, Steph was talking about. And so there's this antigen presentation that has to happen in order for uh, B cells, the antibody producing cells, as well as T cells, which is a cell type we haven't talked about yet. But we need that antigen presentation to happen to activate those cells. So macrophages and another cell type called a dendritic cell are the key orchestrators. So they integrate the information from the microbe. They digest and present these antigens to the T cells and the B cells Mm -hmm. indirectly and activate those components of the immune system. And unless you think that monocytes are really awesome. They can be infected by viruses. They can, yeah. <laughs> Just about every cell can be, right? I was thinking about that. Um, and if they wanted to look at that in humans, would they maybe see seasonality differences with viruses or bacteria? Because bacteria can infect monocytes as well. If yeah. you have an increase in the amount, I think I just was reading uh, chikungunya actually can also infect monocytes. And I, well... That might be a bad example because typically that is in a warm weather climate. Maybe you wouldn't have the seasonality, but let's just say another virus. And would that virus be higher at the time when monocytes are more prevalent in the blood? That would be really interesting to see. Well, according to the seasonality of what they measured in the human samples, yes. So during the the colder times of year when we know influenza and some other viruses, not all, but some of the viruses circulate more, there's more monocytes in the blood. Right. That's cool. That was a very cool study. By the way, it was in circulation research. Yes. And and Gwen told me an interesting uh, thing about the uh, 
the review process. So circulation, they were looking for some place to publish their study pretty fast. Mm -hmm. And circulation research claims they have an acceptance rate within 12 days. And so oh if gosh. you're if you're in this business and you and you know how long it takes to get a paper accepted, that that sounds pretty good. Um, now that's uh, obviously assuming that you can make uh, edits in in that amount of time. But I would think sure. that 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 review will be done within that amount of time. And then usually what happens is an investigator gets comments back from reviewers that says, oh, you didn't do this, you didn't do that. What about this? Think about that. And then you revise your manuscript, do some more experiments and send it back. And in this case, they did that whole human study. So I, I would imagine that they did not get accepted in 12 days, but they, maybe they got the reviews back in that period of time. And then it took them a couple of months to do the extra work before they sure. resubmitted mm -hmm. it again. Hmm. The, there are three co-first authors on this paper. There are. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse Williams, Andrew Elvington, and Stoyan Ivanov. Yeah. This journal does a neat thing with those authors. I don't know if you all had seen, but they do little profiles yeah. of, of the first author and they interview them. And it's pretty it's neat. It's cool. It's cool. Yeah. So what Gwen told me is that um, the one... And I don't remember if it was Andrew or Stoyan started these studies. And he basically said, you know, oh, let's put these mice at these different temperatures and do this really easy experiment. And it turned out the striking phenotype. And so she was trying to get somebody to pick this up. And it turns out Jesse ended up picking this project up. And she said it wasn't his main focus. So it took him a little while to get this project done. But it ended up being he was first author on this. And in fact, she told me he's looking for a job right now. So he's looking for his own lab. If anyone's interested. <laughs> well, he'll get the immune bump. Yes, the immune yes. bump. <laughs> Whatever that's worth, we'll try. Well, it's uh, we're brand new, so right now maybe not a lot. but The we, bump uh, will build over time. We're, maybe he'll have a faculty position by the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and we, we always like to say people get the TWIV bump and so forth. Yeah. But, uh, and we're, we are, our goal is with immune to make it in the same category, right? So you can get right. an immune bump. Absolutely. Uh, do we want to do picks of the week, Steph, on immune? Yeah, why not? I think we could. I, I don't know if I actually have a pick. Do you all have a pick? Yeah, we did our homework, Steph. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't include mine. Do you um, want to look for one while we give ours? Yeah, sure, sure. So that you, you don't want to be on immune one without a pick, Steph. <laughs> no, right. I'll find something. S uh, Cindy, what do you have as a pick? So I, I'm really fascinated, um, and I picked this uh, FDA approval of the second CAR T-cell therapy. So this is a chimeric antigen receptor expressed on T-cells. And the first one was approved a couple of months ago. Um, that was Novartis um, that made a drug that they call Kimria. And this second FDA approval is is f for Kite Pharmaceuticals, which Gilead just bought, they must have known this was gonna happen, for $12 billion in August. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so so Kite has Yaskarda, I think is how you say it. But both of these therapies are um, this chimeric antigen receptor, and it's a completely different way of manipulating the immune system. And without going into too much detail, what they do is they take the patient's own T cells out, and then they express a this chimeric antigen receptor that's specific for a tumor, and it's usually a lymphoid tumor, so some sort of immune tumor, like a uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia or something like that. And so they manipulate the expression of a receptor on these T cells, and then they put the T cells back into the patient, and then the T cells go and attack the tumor and kill the tumor. And this uh, apparently works really well when it works. Um, it's extremely dangerous to unleash that type of cell on um, the body, and so there are a lot of side effects. And I think you covered this uh, a little bit on in um, TWIV. It's an extremely mm -hmm. expensive uh, therapy is uh, a couple hundred thousand dollars for one patient. So I think it's maybe not for going to be available for everyone, but um, it seems like it's uh, works for pediatric patients. And so it's really promising therapy. Yeah, we, we did do this on TWIV, <clears throat> a recent one, and um, it's $475,000 per wow. treatment. Wow. Because, you know, it's, uh, it's tailored to the patient. They have to take out your, your T cells and so forth. And Right. It's expensive, and um, which begs the question: you know, who can actually get this, right? Right. right. Unless insurance companies are going to pay for it. it, seems like 
that would be an awful lot for them to pay for. Right. Um, yeah. But so that, I mean, it's an interesting question. I, obviously, so I, I read some articles online that in the Times where the, the developers of the drug said, well, uh, it's worth it to save your life. In, yeah, in, if you have the money, it's worth it. But if, if you yeah, don't that's have the thing. money. Yeah, what if you don't have the money? I think that that's kind well, of... Then we're, <laughs> it's kind of icky, right, to think about that. We're putting you know, that's emphasis right. on people's lives based on the amount of money they have. And I would hope yeah. that, you know, insurance could cover it or with time. I mean, I know they're trying to recoup their costs of the billions of dollars that went into that, but it's, I mean, that's a lot of money. It is a lot of money. They can recoup their costs, but the problem is they typically don't lower the price after they've recouped their costs. That right? is the problem. So a successful drug will then, you know, fund or fuel other programs in a company. And so they don't want to lower the price, but. Uh, I think these are really, really cool therapies. And Cindy, you should do uh, the new one in, on immune at some point because I'd love to hear your yeah, your, yeah. Your, yeah. your view of it, which is you know ours was from a virological viewpoint because one of the, you deliver uh, the, the chimeric antigen receptor via a viral vector. But um, that's right. Would love to hear others, and I love the name Chimera. It's kind of got Chimera in it, right? <laughs> Yes. Chimeric. And then, so this is the thing, CAR. Every, wherever I go now, people are talking about CAR therapy. CAR. And, I, <laughs> right. and like, if you don't know what they're talking about, what, are you getting your CAR fixed? or You know, <laughs> you know I yeah. mean, I was just at uh, Tufts and they were talking about CAR. And I was at Penn, of course, where the original CAR was developed and they just throw it around like, and that's, that's as you said, Cindy, that's immunology. <laughs> that's right. And to me, I think this gets at the, the heart of what, I think this podcast is about, and that's explaining some of these new therapies and new immune based approaches to people who don't, who aren't exposed to that. So, so what is a CAR T cell? What is a T cell? How does it work? And I think it would be great to go over that in a future podcast. For sure. Yeah. The world is, we can do whatever we want. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's limited by us really. I mean, we're, I guess our plan is to do once a month, but we may find that uh, we want to do more, but we'll see. Well, there's certainly enough information oh, yeah. out there to do weekly. It's, uh, you know, we're all busy, so we need to find the time to be able oh, to yeah. do that. Yeah. All right. My pick is Truth Wins by John Udell, because everyone needs to read this. Even if you're not a scientist, you should read it to find out what becoming a, a biomedical research scientist is like. If you're early stage, like Steph, you should read it because it's got a lot of great tips. And even if you're an old person like me and you've gone through it, you should read it because it's just neat to find his insights. I just love it. It's just a really good book. It's free. You can I, I, I'll put a link to the downloads uh, in the show notes. And John is going to be here in New York City in the early November. It turns out his son is a scientist. I think he's at Sloan Kettering here in New York City. Mm. And they're both going to come uh, to the studio and we're going to do a TWIV together. Oh, that's and, great. Uh, yeah, he's a character. He's fantastic. I really like him. Yes, he's quite the character. And um, you can tell by reading the book, right? Oh, yeah. He <laughs> he does, He does. takes off the gloves and he really puts it out there. there yeah, it's great. I love it's it. It's true. And uh, it can be a little disheartening if you read that. Yeah, for, uh, sure. I, yes. <laughs> for sure. I liked his perspective on what it used to be like versus what it is now. Yes. Because some yes. of us are just experiencing what it is now and they don't realize what science was like before. And you can get caught up in in the way papers are done now and the way science is done that that sometimes we lose track of that truth, you know, that the that um, seeking the truth that he talks about. And I think it's really important. I love how he says, cutting the NIH budget is just stupid <laughs> because right so much, point. so and you know, it's not just because we want to be paid. It's because <laughs> sci the return of biomedical science is huge. huge. And I always tell people, your lives are great because of science and technology. And I have a finance friend. She said, no, it's because of finance. I said, no, I'm sorry. You may give the money, but you'd be dead if it weren't for vaccines and medicines. <laughs> Yeah, right. 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 And I'd argue also the way that we produce food and the ability to produce a large quantity of food and our nutrition and the way we grow and develop based on modern agriculture can also be a little tip of the hat to biomedical because of totally. genetically totally. modified organisms. He he tells the story of how after World War II, the U.S. realized that it's the ability of the Allies to prevail was based on science. 
mm-hmm. you know, the radar, the sonar, uh, the antibiotics, all this stuff. And a fellow named Vannevar Bush said to the president, you need to invest heavily in the NIH. And that's where it all started, really. Yeah. And we seem to be forgetting that today, you we know, do. where we're forgetting basic research, meaning just do what you're interested in and good things will happen as opposed to curing cancer. Right. That's that's, that's what we right. that's what we call right. translational. And there's a, a there's a place for some of that. But you also need to let scientists follow their curiosity. And, you- and I think part of the problem is that the general public doesn't understand what it takes and what what we sacrifice and, and what we do, you know, with our passion to study this all the time with every ounce of energy. And they just dismiss that. Yeah, and it's too easy to say, why are you working on worms and flies? What's that going to do? Right. Well, you know what? It turns out it's really relevant. <laughs> and that's, it absolutely is. And that's Toll-like what we, receptors were identified in flies. flies. Yeah. So that's what we try and do on these podcasts. And, and uh, here's another one for you to listen to. <laughs> Steph, yeah. Steph, did you find a pick? <laughs> I did. I had one the whole time. I was just acting, you know, I was just playing my role as the young PhD student. Oh, I'm glad. I'm glad. <laughs> uh, no, I actually did have something in my queue. It's a paper that I'm just starting to read, and maybe readers would be interested in kind of of doing it along with me and we could even kind of touch upon it. I, I may do a little Twitter storm about how I read scientific papers as a PhD student, how I was taught. Um, I may be able to kind of fulfill that role as the, as the person who is still in the training process and, and maybe shed some light on, on how to go about tackling some of these papers. So this, uh, it's a recent paper. It recently was published just last week. And it is in Nature Immunology. It's kind of an intersection between TWIV and immune. But I'm really fascinated with the idea of this hygiene hypothesis. Now, if you haven't heard of it, it's really contributing the rise of asthma and allergy to the fact that we are not exposed to as many allergens and pathogens maybe as we once were when we lived in a less sanitary environment. We were more agrarian. Um, and so they they kind of contribute that, that the less amount of pathogens then your system cannot become tolerant to those over, t- over time. And then that results in, in a hyper um, response to different allergens. So what they did was they wanted to determine, well, if we take these infant um, mice and we give them a gamma herpes virus, um, and can th- giving a young animal a virus affect the subsequent development of allergic asthma? And um, if they determined that it did. In fact, they used a house dust mite to induce the asthma after they gave these mice the murine herpes virus at four, MUHV4. And they showed that the clinical observation of asthma was decreased and they were able to look at the immune cells. And this really um, talks to some of the cells we were discussing today with monocytes and macrophages. Um, something that's in these uh, studies. And it showed that the embryonic alveolar macrophages that are resident in the lungs with the infection of the herpes virus, they were kind of moved out and replaced by monocytes with regulatory functions. And so mm. that those regulatory functions were able to downgrade the response of um, the Th2 subset of helper T cells to the house dust mite. And I find this fascinating. I mean, really, you know, the hygiene hypothesis, I think in some circles, people kind of dismiss it. It's kind of like old news or people are really thinking that this could be true. And um, so this paper is entitled, A Gamma Herpes Virus Provides Protection Against Allergic Asthma by Inducing the Replacement of Resident Alveolar Macrophages with Regulatory Monocytes. So this is on my queue this week. This is a little night reading. If anybody wants to read it with me, I don't know. It doesn't seem to be open access. Um, we can lament that. But uh, yeah, I think that it's fascinating. And we will talk about allergy and asthma and its relation to how people live in the environments that they grow up in and how what happens during your infancy can project the way you will respond to a variety of things um, in the future. Okay, so can you put that link in the show notes for me, Steph? Yeah, sure can. And uh, maybe you'll do it in the future, right? Sure. (laughs) Cool. All right, that's Immune. This is episode one. It'll be eventually on Apple Podcasts. It's at microbe.tv slash immune, where you'll find the show notes, which means links and references to things that we talk about if you want to explore them further. Uh, And you should subscribe. I'm sure you all have a favorite 
podcast app that you use on your phone or tablet or computer. Just subscribe so you get every episode uh, as we release them. And as I said earlier, we'd love to get your questions, comments, suggestions, immune at microbe.tv. The scientists of immune are Cindy Leifer from Cornell University. Thanks, Cindy. Absolutely. My pleasure. Cindy is on Twitter, Cindy Leifer, all one word. That's right. Steph Langle is at Ohio State University. Thanks, Steph. Thank you. This is wonderful. Stephanie Langle on Twitter. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'm P-R-O-F-V-R-R on Twitter. The music you hear on Immune is by Steve Neal. You can find more of his work at stephenealpercussion.com. There'll be a link in the show notes. Do you know this fella, Steve Neal? I do. I do. Dude, Steve Neal, he's actually my brother, (laughs) and uh, he is fantastic. And I just looked at that um, website. It does look like Steve and Neal all squished together, but it's just Steve Neal, E-A-L percussion. Stephen E-A-L percussion, right? Oh, Steve Neal, right. Yeah, right, right. Sorry, you got it. (laughs) Looks like so you can uh, you can go see him. He's got a performance schedule. Look at this, neat. So he's a he's a percussionist, right? He is. He is, and he's a lecturer and professor at the College of Worcester. So neat. he does that too. And so the music he wrote specifically for his sister, right? <laughs> he did. He did. <laughs> How nice. Well, thank, Very nice. thanks, Steve. You've been listening to Immune, the podcast that's infectious. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next month.